Um, yeah, so last year I had a paper at Sloan about mental pressure. Today I'm talking about defensive pressure or pressing. I suppose that everyone here knows quite well what defensive pressure is. But who knows who of these coaches has the most effective implementation of pressing? Yeah, no one, right? So that's why I think that pressing is still hard. So it's, it's difficult, and there is no clear recipe, and comparing two strategies is highly subjective. So all of these coaches got wide acclaim for their pressing strategy, but all of their strategies are somewhat different. Um, that's also why club analysts and media analysts are very interested in gaining insights into how these teams conduct pressing and in which context pressing is most effective. So there's a lot of opportunity for analytics here. And I think there are four questions to be answered. So where do teams press? When do teams press? How do teams press? And how effective do teams press? There's already quite some interesting work on each of these questions, just to give a very brief overview of it. So Boginov and Born at the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference, they developed a regression model to model where teams are more likely to disrupt possession and where they are less likely. In terms of when teams uh, press, most work here has been done on Gagan pressing, so where the trigger to press is losing possession. And now with Stasbom, new pressing events in their data streams, it is actually very easy. It's an attribute in their data. Then probably the most popular metric for pressing in football is the PPDA metric, which stands for passing, passing allowed per defensive action. is the ratio between the number of passes by the attacking team divided by the number of defensive actions. So it's the, it, it, it expresses how often the team decides to press when it has the opportunity to press, and it basically measure, measures the aggressiveness of pressing. And then in terms of the effectiveness of pressing, um, some people have tried to invert expected passing models to, um, to derive how good teams are, are disrupting the ability of the, how good teams are at disrupting passes of the other team. So definitely some interesting research on this topic already, but I think there's still a lot of work to do. I think it's one of the topics which has the largest discrepancy between the public interest and the research done so far especially on this fourth question, how effective do teams press? So far, all metrics only consider the positive outcome of pressing, while I think there's definitely also a negative outcome. So in my opinion, the decision to press or not to press is always a trade-off between the risk of leaving a defensive structure and creating more space for the opponent to attack and the reward of recovering the ball. So I've taken two short clips from a game between Liverpool and Man City. And at some point, City passes the, back, passes the ball back to their goalkeeper, Ederson. What did you do? <laughs> I didn't do anything. <laughs> so, um, what you could see here is that Liverpool immediate presses on the goalkeeper but they are a bit too late and the goalkeeper can easily pass the ball to their right back, Laporte. Um, then Milner has to leave his defensive position, um, and, but he's again too late and Laporte can pass the ball forward. And at this point, like, um, Man City has a lot of room to, to counter. At this point, almost half of Liverpool is in front of the ball, but luckily... There's still the, the right back of Liverpool, Robertson, who can recover the ball, set up a new attack, and this is clearly the positive outcome of recovering the ball. So my goal is to quantify the expected risk and reward of each pressure action. Before I explain how I did that, I have to tell you something about the data that I used. So I used um, event stream data provided by Stelsbomb of previous season for the top five European leagues. I guess everyone knows what this event data looks like. This is a short example from a game between Barcelona and Huesca. It starts with a pass backward from the left winger to the left back. The left back makes a short dribble, passes back to the goalkeeper. Goalkeeper makes a short dribble and then kicks a long pass that doesn't arrive. 
So in Stasbomb event data, all these actions are represented by a nested JSON object that's quite hard to work with. We machine learning engineers like to work with flat tabular data. So my first step is to convert these actions to that flat tabular data structure. Therefore, I use the SPEDAL language. It's open source. It's a converter both for Statsbomb, Wisecout, uh, Optadata, and you can convert all actions to the same eight attributes and then store all of them in a, in a database. It's super helpful if you want to do analyze on this kind of data, so definitely check it out. Then what's interesting about Statsbomb data is also that it includes these pressure events. These are custom events that are triggered when the defender comes within a, a five yard radius of the attacker, but this radius can grow up to 10 yards when losing the ball would prove more costly for the attacker. So here where Rakitic presses, the, the radius is probably around 5 yards, while where Suarez presses on the goalkeeper, the radius is probably close to 10 yards. Then I made a small extension to the SPEDAL language to include these pressure events, used a yeah, similar structure for that. And then we can formalize our Sokol analytics task. So given a game state S and the game state, that's all the actions which happened up to a certain point in the game. And then a set of pressure events P in that game state, we want to assign a value to each pressure event P. That value is what I called the VPP metric. It stands for valuing pressure events by estimating probabilities. And it's heavily inspired by the VAPE framework by Tom de Cruz, who is here as well, and will present another extension later today. So, hardly recommend his talk as well. Um, it's a framework for rating all actions in a soccer game, except pressing so far, which I've tried to do now. But back to VPP, it's based on the intuition that a good pressing action P in a game state S maximizes the short term probability of recovering the ball and minimizes the short-term probability of conceding a goal-scoring opportunity compared to not pressing at all. So if you remember that short clip which I showed from Liverpool against Man City, it is exactly the same. If you decide to press, you want that your pressure action increases the probability to recover the ball more than it increases the probability of conceding a goal-scoring opportunity by leaving a defensive structure. And this is the mathematical formulation. So the VPP score in a game state S affected by a pressure event P is the increase in the probability of recovering the ball minus the, probabil minus the increase in the probability of conceding a goal scoring chance. I've included that constant C because um, the cost of conceding a goal scoring chance is typically much higher than the reward of recovering the ball. I set C to 5, don't really have a sound reason for that, but it gave good results. So. So maybe you noticed what I've done now. So I've transformed the subjective task of assigning ratings to pressing e events to the objective machine learning task of estimating probabilities. So this is a machine learning task we have to solve. We have to estimate the probability of recovering the ball in a game state and the probability of conceding a goal scoring attack in a game state. We can solve this with a prototypical machine learning pipeline so we have two steps, a training phase and an application phase. During the training phase, we have to um, construct features or a mathemat mat mathematical representation for all the game states in the event data. And we have to assign a label to each of those game states. So was the ball eventually recovered or not? Then we can train a model, a probabilistic classifier. And then finally, we can apply that model on new um, event data or new game states and it will then output the probability of recovering the ball for those game states. We need two of those models, one for recovering the ball, one for conceding a goal scoring opportunity, but they're basically the same, the only difference is the label. So we need three, three things. We have to convert our event data to a set of features, we have to assign labels, and we have to um, choose and train a probabilistic classifier. We will now explain how I did each of them. So to describe each game state as, we have four sets of features. Five, we, first we have simple features. These are explicitly included in the speller representation. So for the three last actions in each game state, 
We extract features like the type of the action, the result of the action, the body part used to perform that action, the, and location of that action. Then second, we have complex features that um, define relations between consecutive actions or, using or combine information within the same action. Those are things like the distance to the goal, the time difference between two actions, the distance traveled during an action, and stuff like that. Then I have context features like the goal difference because we see that often teams play more offensively or more defensively when they are behind or leading. And then finally, this is the most important part, the pressing features to describe how a, team's, how a team presses, or a player presses in this case. So there we have the distance between the defender and the ball, the angle between the defender, the ball, and the goal. This explains um, from which direction the player is pressing, and the time delay between um, the start of the action and the start of the pressing event. Then we need the labels. So if you have a game state, followed by two passes and then a recovery, there's probably a relation between the game state and the recovery of the ball. On the, on, the, on the other hand, if there's a gap of 10 minutes between the game state and recovering the ball, there's probably no relation at all. So I give a positive label or a label of one to a game state. Um, if the defending team can recover the ball in the next four actions and zero or false otherwise, and similarly for attack, a one if the attacking team can shoot a goal in the next seven actions, and zero otherwise. Then we need finally our probabilistic classifier, and there we have two requirements. Obviously, it should be accurate, so it should predict accurately whether the defending team will either recover the ball or concede a goal scoring opportunity in the near future. To measure that, I used the um, area under the ROC curve. Um, I use this metric because there's a large imbalance between both um, classes, so there are way more examples of a team not recovering the ball than recovering the ball in the next four actions, and similarly for shots. And what we see here, for the first, for the probability of recovering the ball, I got an area under the ROC curve of 0.9. For the other one, I get a value of 0.81, so that, that's pretty good. Then second requirement, it sh we should have a proper probability calibration, so the predicted probabilities should correspond with the true underlying probability distribution of the data. What I mean by that, so if we if a team, if we assign a probability of 60% to a game state of recovering the ball, then that means that if that game state would be played on from that point 100 times, that the team should recover the ball about 60%. Um, the problem, each game state is played only once, so we can't evaluate that. What we do instead is we create a bin that contains all game states in our test set for which the model predicts the probability to recover the ball of about 60%. And then if our model is well calibrated, about 60% of the game states in that bin should actually recover in a recovery, should actually result in recovery in the near future. So the diagonal line represents perfect calibration, the blue line is calibration of our model, and again we can see that both models are very good calibrated. But I've done something uncommon now, I've given the results before, I've given how I, I approach the problem. So I've used the stack model, first gradient boosting model, <coughs> and then on top a logistic regression model on the least because I had a bit of trouble with achieving a good calibration and this fixed it. So now we've solved our machine learning task. We have the features, which is a combination of simple features, complex features, context features, and pressing features. We have the labels, so a one if ball recovery in the next four actions, otherwise zero. A one if the team concedes a shot in the next action, zero otherwise. And we have our probabilistic classifier, a gradient boosting model with logistic regression on the least. <laughs> Then we, can back to, then we can go back to our Stoker Analytics task. So now we can simply fill in these probabilities into our VPEP um, equi equation. And this is what we get for the example I showed previously. So that doesn't work. 
Um, but for the first action where Rakitic press, press, presses, you can see that um, it doesn't really affect the probability of recovering the ball too much because the um, defender can easily pass backward and keep possession. Also, it doesn't increase the probability of conceding a goal-scoring opportunity a lot because Rakitic can really press the defender against the sideline. So there's not a lot of opportunity there for a defender to pass Rakitic. Um, similarly for Messi, defender can still pass backward. Um, it's high up the pitch, so low probability of conceding a goal-scoring opportunity. But then for Suarez, we see that he gets a very high VPP score. So he can really push the goalkeeper against the back line, such that he doesn't have any other opportunity than kicking the ball for. And it's always easier to recover these high passes than um, short, low passes on the ground. Then this is what we get if we average the VPP metric across all teams during past season. I think it includes the usual suspects like Bayern Munich, Napoli, Man City, Barcelona, Dortmund. These are all teams which I would associate with um, great pressing strategies. But maybe a surprise for some of you is Ibar, which is on top. It's one of the smallest teams in the La Liga. And I have to admit that I've never seen a game of Ibar, but if you Google for them, you will find a lot of blog posts. Um, describing their unique pressing strategy. So I think there's some general agreement about how good they are at pressing. Um, they have a high and very intense wing-oriented pressing strategy, so they really push the other teams to the side and then try to recover the ball. Um, it's also interesting to look at other statistics. So um, across all teams of previous season, they are a team with the most possession regains in the final third of the pitch, so they are definitely effective in recovering the ball. And also, they conceded the third lowest shots per game. Um, only teams like Bayern Munich, Barcelona, I think Inter, and one other team conceded fewer shots per game last season. So they are also very effective at limiting shots, but they have one problem. If they concede a goal-scoring opportunity, it's almost always a goal. <laughs> That's also why they didn't win La Liga. Um, they, uh, their expected goals against per shots is very high. It's also interesting to compare our VPP, VPP metric with other metrics, um, like the possession regains in the final third. We can see that um, the, there's a very good agreement between the top teams considering possession regains in the final third and the top teams considering our VPP metric. Um, also compare it with passes per defensive action. If you remember that, that's a metric to measure the aggressiveness of pressing. And again, we can see a strong agreement, but there are some differences, like Dortmund. It doesn't have a very high PPDA, but it still is ranked 10th if you look at VPP. So I think that um, our VP metric doesn't simply measure the aggressiveness of pressing, but it measures something differently. And I hope that's, the in, that's intelligent pressing. Another th interesting thing, is to look at the effect of fatigue on pressing. So pressing requires high level of fitness. And what we see if we average the VPP metric for each team uh, per time frame in the game, we can see that on average teams have a positive VPP me metric during the first 15 minutes of the game, but then it quickly tapers off as the game progresses. So I think this shows that a lot of teams can't maintain their pressing strategy during the entire game. Also compared Man City against Liverpool, and again, Man City is much better at maintaining their pressing strategy during the course of the game than Liverpool. For Man City, it only tapers off during the final 15 minutes of each game. For Liverpool, it tapers off after the first half hour of the game. So I think these are already some interesting results, but there are definitely some limitations. Um, First, the information in the event stream is very limited, like pressing is actually a team effort and we can only see the player that is initializing the press. So if you look at individual pressing actions and then compare them with the video stream, well, it's, yeah, it's hard to, sometimes you really can't agree with um, the VPP metric. But after all, if you average it over many actions, it can be insightful. 
Another problem that I had is that these pressing events are often applied on multiple events, like when a player passes the ball, that often starts with um, a ball received, then a short dribble, and then the actual pass, and often the VPP metric is largest on that short dribble. And what I do then is I take um, the, 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 the action on which the VPP metric has the largest effect, but maybe there are better approaches to deal with that. Another problem is that pressing is often applied by multiple players. Um, then you have to um, distribute the credit for the pressing actions among those players. Didn't have a solution to do that. What I did now is um, I distributed the credit equally between each player that is pressing. And finally, I didn't have a lot of time to, to do parameter tuning like those, those, um, those cost parameters C, which I give the value 5. Um, yeah. That's definitely something to work on in the future. So in conclusion, the VPP metric is a novel metric for pressing in football, and compared to the existing metrics, it quantifies the effectiveness of pressing as a trade-off between the benefits of recovering the ball and the risk of leaving the defensive structure. It assigns a value to each individual game state, and it takes the context of the pressing into account. Thanks.